Internal Rate of Return, Part 2. The internal rate of return is an average of the returns expected in each period of a multi-period project that takes into account compounding. It's the project's average compound return. However, the internal rate of return has no real economic meaning. It's just a mathematical relationship. It's that discount rate that makes net present value equal zero. And the consequence of the math can present some problems when evaluating capital investments. The problems presented by the internal rate of return can be divided into general problems and problems particular to mutually exclusive projects. We'll examine those problems starting with the general problems. The internal rate of return has two general problems. The internal rate of return rule must conform to investment and financing decisions. And atypical cash flow streams can have multiple internal rates of return. Let's consider the internal rate of return decision criteria for investment decisions and financing decisions. And let's begin with the investment decision. An investment project has the following cash flows. The first cash flow is negative, and the subsequent cash flow is positive. The typical investment project pays out to purchase the investment and receives a future cash inflow as a return on the investment. The internal rate of return decision rule for investment decisions is to accept the investment project if its internal rate of return is greater than its opportunity cost of capital. Our project's 20% internal rate return is greater than a 10% opportunity cost of capital. So this project should be accepted by the internal rate of return rule. The project's net present value is positive, and the project would also be accepted by the net present value rule. So the NPV rule and the internal rate of return rule are in agreement. Now consider the financing decision. The first cash flow is positive, and the subsequent cash flow is negative. This is typical for a borrowing case. You receive the borrowed funds as a cash inflow, and at a future date you pay back the loan with interest. The total rate of return is again greater than the cost of capital. But should the borrowing be accepted? No. In this borrowing case, you would be borrowing at 20% while the market rate is 10%. If you can borrow at below market rates, you should do so, but you shouldn't borrow at above market rates. So for financing decisions, the internal rate of return rule should be to accept the financing if the internal rate of return is less than the opportunity cost of capital. So you should reject this borrowing opportunity. The borrowing's net present value is negative, and the borrowing opportunity is also rejected by the net present value rule. So the two decision rules are once again in agreement. The important point is that the criteria of the internal rate of return decision rules must conform to whether the decision is an investment decision or a financing decision. These are the NPV profiles for a typical investment and financing decision. The investment decision is decreasing in the discount rate. The financing decision is increasing in the discount rate. As long as they're strictly decreasing or increasing in the discount rate, the internal rate of return rule and the net present value rule will be in agreement for independent projects. The multiple rates of return problem. This project has an atypical cash flow stream. It begins with a negative cash flow, followed by a series of positive cash flows, and concludes with a negative cash flow. An example would be a project that has significant closing costs at the end of the project. Consider, for example, a strip mining project. The first stage is the initial investment in excavating the mine. 
profits of the mining operations are received in the second stage. The third stage is shutting down the project. This would involve costs to reclaim the land and costs to satisfy requirements of environmental protection laws and regulations. The project's cash flow stream exhibits more than one change of sign, from a negative to a positive, and from a positive to a negative. And this has mathematical consequences. Let's look at the resulting NPV profile. This atypical cash flow stream has an atypical NPV profile. And mathematically, there are two discount rates that make net present value zero. And therefore, by definition, there are two internal rates of return. This is a non-uniqueness problem of multiple internal rates of return. When there's more than one change of sign in the cash flow stream, there's no unique internal rate of return. In fact, there may be as many internal rates of return as there are changes in sign in the cash flow stream. These multiple internal rates of return render the internal rate of return rule inoperable. Given a problem of multiple internal rates of return, there's a technique to make a rate of return rule operable by calculating a modified internal rate of return. The cash flow stream is modified to remove the change in sign. An internal rate of return is calculated using the modified cash flow stream to obtain a modified internal rate of return. The modified internal rate of return is compared against the opportunity cost of capital to make an accept reject decision. But the cash flow stream is modified by the opportunity cost of capital. And so the modified internal rate of return is not independent of the cost of capital. The opportunity cost of capital is used in its calculation. And the modified internal rate of return is not a true internal rate of return because it's not generated internally solely by the project's cash flows and its cost. It's dependent on the cost of capital. There are two methods to calculate a modified internal rate of return. In calculating modified internal rates of return, the cash flow stream is modified by discounting particular cash flows in the first method or compounding all cash flows in the second method to remove multiple changes of sign in the cash flow stream. Let's apply the first method to our example cash flow stream. When there's more than one change of sign in the cash flow stream, there's no unique internal rate of return. This cash flow stream has two changes of sign. Let's remove the second change of sign occurring at the end of the cash flow stream. We discount the negative $150 in year six back one year and add this discounted cash payment to the cash payment in year five. And we'll assume a discount rate of 10%. So the negative $150 in year six is discounted back one year at 10%. Its value in year five is a negative $136.36. We add this value to the $150 cash flow in year five. The result is a modified cash flow in year five of $13.64. If the change in sign is rectified, we calculate an internal rate of return. If not, we continue the process. We remove the change of sign from the cash flow stream. So we calculate an internal rate of return from the modified cash flow stream and get a modified internal rate of return of 15%. This is not the average compound return for the original cash flow stream. I really don't know what interpretation to give to it with respect to the original cash flow stream, but that's the methodology. The modified internal rate of return is compared against the cost of capital. The 15% modified internal rate of return is greater than the 10% cost of capital, so the project is accepted. Note that the opportunity cost of capital is used to modify the cash flow stream. 
and that cash flow stream is used to calculate the modified internal rate of return. So the cost of capital influences the value of the modified internal rate of return. And the modified internal rate of return is not independent of the cost of capital. So when we compare the modified internal rate of return against the cost of capital, the measure is not independent of the financial standard as it should be. But that's the methodology. In the second method, to calculate a modified internal rate of return, all the cash flows are compounded to their future value at the end of the period. And all future values are summed to get a total future value. An internal rate of return is calculated for this modified cash flow stream to get a modified internal rate of return. This is the method used in the modified internal rate of return formula available on the Excel spreadsheet. And this method would be useful and the cash flow stream has a number of changes assigned. After compounding the cash flows and summing, we get a total future value of $1,904.17 in year 6. The modified internal rate of return for this cash flow stream is 10.2%. Note that with all this compounding get the cost of capital, this modified internal rate of return is even more dependent on the cost of capital. The modified internal rate of return is greater than the 10% cost of capital, barely, and the project is accepted. Now let's calculate these modified internal rate of returns in a spreadsheet. Modified internal rates of return. We have our cash flow stream and our 10% opportunity cost of capital. Before we solve for the modified internal rates return, let's solve for the original internal rates return for this cash flow stream. There are two changes to signs in this cash flow stream, so there's two internal rates return. One is larger, one is smaller, relatively. The internal rate of return formula uses a default 10% discount rate as its initial guess in the iterative solution for the internal rate of return. So it will provide one of the internal rates of return. But I'll finesse the formula to get both. So let's go to our financial formulas and find IRR. Let's input in the cash flow stream. I put my cursor on the first cash flow in the cash flow stream and shift click on the last cash flow in the cash flow stream and the entire cash flow stream is input into the formula. Into guess I'll input a 99% and this will give me the larger internal rate of return 15%. Let's do that again so we go to our finance functions, scroll down, get IRR, input in the cash flow stream, and this time in the guess I'll put a negative 99%. And this will give me the smaller internal rate of return, which is negative 50. So there are two discount rates that make net present value zero at 15% and negative 50%. And by definition, these are internal rates of return. Now let's calculate a modified internal rate of return using the first methodology. I discount the negative $150 in year 6 back to time 5. So let's go to our financial functions, scroll down, and pick out PV present value. Our rates 10%, number of periods, I'm going to discount that back one year, the year six, and in the FV future value, I'll input the negative $150 in year six. But remember the PV formula in Excel will reverse the sign of the future value to indicate the cash flow from the decision maker's point of view at time zero. And I don't want that. I want to maintain the original sign. 
So to maintain the original sign, I first input a negative, and then I input my cash flow. I get a year five value of a negative $136.36. I add that to the $150 cash flow in time five to get a modified cash flow for year five. So let's go to our math trig functions, scroll down, and get sum. In the number one, let me put my $150 year five cash flow. In number two, my negative $136.36. And I get a modified cash flow at time five of $13.64. I removed the change of sign. So let me copy the other cash flows. And this gives me my modified cash flow stream. Now let's solve for the modified internal rate of return. Go to our finance formulas, scroll down, and pick IRR. Input our modified cash flow stream, and we get a modified internal rate of return of 15%. Now let's calculate the modified internal rate of return using the second method. In the second method, we would compound all the cash flows out to year six and sum all the future values to get a total future value at year six. And then calculate an internal rate of return for this modified cash flow stream. But we don't have to do this because the MIRR formula in Excel does it for us. So let's go to our financial functions scroll down and pick MIRR. Let's input our cash flow stream and we're asked to input a finance function and a reinvestment rate. What we want to input is a reinvestment rate and that reinvestment rate should be the opportunity cost of capital. So let's put 10% into our reinvestment rate. And we get a modified internal rate of return of 10.2%. Problems of the internal rate of return rule particular to mutually exclusive projects. When choosing among mutually exclusive projects, the internal rate of return decision rule ranks each project by their internal rate of return and chooses that project with the highest internal rate of return. But the internal rate of return is unreliable in choosing among mutually exclusive projects. It has problems with the scale of the projects and the timing of the cash flow streams. The internal rate of return is unreliable when ranking projects of different scale because it ignores issues of scale. And let's illustrate that with an example. Two partners of an independent film studio have purchased the rights to principles of corporate finance, the movie. They will produce this movie either on a small budget or a big budget. Because of high risk, a 25% discount rate is considered appropriate. A small budget will cost $10 million, and its box office will result in a cash flow of $40 million. Its NPV is $22 million. Its total rate of return, 300%. The large budget movie will cost $25 million. Its box office will generate a cash flow of $65 million. Its net present value is $25 million. And its total rate of return is 160%. One partner wants to adopt a small budget because of the high in total rate of return. Look, he says, the small budget returns 300%. The large budget returns 160%. With the small budget movie, we get a 300% return on every dollar we invest. It gives us a bigger bang per buck. And so we should go with the small budget movie. He's absolutely right, but it's a wrong decision. The other partner wants the large budget because it has a larger net present value. And why is he correct? 
Well, just ask yourself, what would you rather have in your bank account? $27 million or $22 million? The net present value rule made the correct decision. Net present value is a measure of the absolute change in wealth from the acceptance of a project. To maximize wealth, we would choose those projects that have the biggest impact on our wealth. And so the net present value rule always makes the correct decision. The total rate of return is a relative measure that by itself doesn't see the scale of the projects. So choosing the alternative with the highest internal rate of return, the project with the biggest bang per buck, is not always consistent with wealth maximization when a significant difference in scale exists among the alternatives. The timing problem. Consider two mutually exclusive projects, A and B. Both projects cost $10,000 and will last for three years. Project A pays $10,000 in year one and $1,000 in year two and in year three. Project B pays $1,000 in year one and in year two and pays $12,000 in year three. The opportunity cost of capital is 10% and we calculate the internal rate of return and net present value for both projects. The internal rate of return rule will choose project A. It has a higher internal rate of return. The net present value rule would choose project B. B has a higher net present value. So they made conflicting decisions. But of course net present value made the correct decision. We would rather be $751 wealthier than $669 wealthier. There's no difference in the scale between the projects. But what is different? What's different is the timing of the cash flows. A has a higher early cash flows. Let's look at the NPV profiles for both projects. The profile for A is in red, the profile for B is in blue. The internal rate of return for each project is the point where their NPV profiles cross the x-axis, where net present value equals zero. Project A has the higher internal rate of return. The crossover point for the two projects is called the incremental internal rate of return. At that point, the projects have equal net present values. The significance of the crossover point is that for cost of capital less than the incremental internal rate of return, the internal rate of return rule makes the wrong decision. The project with the lower internal rate of return will have the higher net present value. The internal rate of return is unreliable when choosing among mutually exclusive projects as it has a bias in favor of higher early cash flows. It has this bias because of its reinvestment assumption. We assume the cash flows of projects are reinvested over the life of the project to achieve a compounded return. The net present value and internal rate of return make different reinvestment assumptions. The net present value assumes a reinvestment at the cost of capital. The internal rate of return assumes a reinvestment at the internal rate of return. As projects being considered will have internal rates of return greater than their opportunity cost of capital, the internal rate of return is assuming reinvestment at the higher reinvestment rate. So future cash flows will have less value, giving a bias for cash flow streams with higher early cash flows. But what is the correct reinvestment assumption? At what rate would you reinvest the project's cash flows? at the opportunity cost of capital or at the project's internal rate of return. A rate of return greater than the opportunity cost of capital is special. It's unique to the project and exists within a window of opportunity. It has to be seized while it's still available. 
so reinvestment can't be done at the internal rate of return. But all investors have access to the rates of return available in the financial markets. So the correct reinvestment assumption is reinvestment at the cost of capital. The internal rate of return is suspect when evaluating mutually exclusive projects. It's best to calculate net present value. But if you really want to use an internal rate of return technique, the internal rate of return can be used to evaluate mutually exclusive projects by calculating the incremental internal rate of return. By calculating the incremental internal rate of return and comparing it to the cost of capital, we identify on which side of the NPV profile the decision is made. If the incremental internal rate of return is greater than the opportunity cost of capital, the project with the lower internal rate of return is the better project and should be selected. If the incremental internal rate of return is less than the opportunity cost of capital, the project with the higher internal rate of return is the better project and should be selected. We calculate an internal rate of return on incremental cash flows to determine the incremental internal rate of return. So let's consider our example and let's go to the project with a lower internal rate of return and ask, is project B better than project A? So we'll look at the incremental investment in B over A and calculate the incremental cash flows by subtracting A from B. negative 10,000 minus negative 10,000 is zero. 1,000 minus 10,000 is negative 9,000. 1,000 minus 1,000 is zero. 12,000 minus 1,000 is 11,000. We calculate an internal rate of return on these incremental cash flows to get the incremental internal rate of return. 10.55%. If the incremental internal rate of return is greater than the cost of capital, we would choose project B. The cost of capital is 10%, the incremental rate of return is 10.55%, and therefore we should choose project B. We can also calculate an incremental net present value on incremental cash flows. The incremental investment in project B has a positive net present value, indicating a positive increment in wealth over project A. Now let's calculate this in a spreadsheet. The incremental internal rate of return. We have our two projects, A and B, and the opportunity cost of capital, 10%. We start by calculating the internal rates return for each project to identify that project with the lowest internal rate of return. So let's go to formulas, to financial formulas, scroll down and select IRR. The cost of the project and the project's cash flows are inputted into the formula. So put my cursor on the cost and shift click on the last cash flow. And we have the internal rate of return for project A. Let me copy that and paste it in for project B. And we have our internal rate of return for project B. Now let's also calculate net present value. So we go to our finance formulas to our financial functions and select NPV. Remember the NPV formula doesn't calculate net present value, but it does calculate the present value of a cash flow stream. So we input our rate, 10%, and into value 1 we input our cash flow stream. And this cash flow stream doesn't include the cost of the project. So I put my cursor on the first cash payment in the cash flow stream and shift click on the last cash payment. And that gives me the present value of the cash flow stream. 
Now I want to adjust this formula in the formula bar to calculate net present value. So I put a plus and then I input in the cost of the project and hit return. And that gives me net present value. Let me copy and paste that in the project B to get B's net present value. So we identified the project with a lower internal rate of return, project B. Now let's calculate the incremental cash flows. Now let's calculate B minus A. So let's go into our formulas, to our math and trig formulas, scroll down and pick sum. In the number one, I put my cash flow for project B. In the number two, I put a negative, the cash flow for project A. And I get my incremental cash flow at time zero. Let's copy that, paste it for the other cash flows. And now we have our incremental cash flows of B minus A. And let's do this for A minus B. Go to our formulas, math trig formulas, scroll down, select sum. This time in number one, we put the cash flow for project A. In number two, a negative project B cash flow. Let's copy that and paste it for the other three years. All right, so we have our incremental cash flows. Let's calculate an internal rate of return on those incremental cash flows, and that'll be the incremental internal rate of return. Formulas, financial formulas, IRR. Let's input our incremental cash flows, B minus A. And we get our incremental internal rate of return, 10.55%. Let's copy that and calculate incremental internal rate of return for the incremental cash flows, A minus B. And of course, we get the same 10.55% for the incremental cash flow. We compare the incremental cash flow against the opportunity cost of capital. And if the incremental cash flow is greater than the opportunity cost of capital, then the decision is made on the left-hand side of the NPV profile, and we pick the project with the lower internal rate of return. So the incremental IRR is greater than the cost of capital, and so project B is the better project, and we should select project B. Let's calculate the incremental net present value. Let's copy our net present value formula and paste it in for the incremental cash flows to get an incremental net present value. And let's note the incremental cash flow for B minus A is positive, indicating that B is a better project, and the incremental cash flow for A minus B is negative indicating that A should not be selected and B is a better project. So to solve the incremental cash flows, that's done in two stages. The first stage is to calculate the internal rates of return for each project to identify the project with the lowest internal rate of return. And then we calculate the incremental cash flows and determine the incremental internal rate of return, two stages. It's simpler and easier just to calculate a net present value. Concluding points. In practice, the internal rate of return is a popular decision rule, perhaps because it's easy and intuitive to think in terms of rates of return. And the internal rate of return captures the entire project in a single value that's easy to communicate. But as we have seen, the internal rate of return has deficiencies. Mathematically, cash flow strains with multiple changes of sign.
of multiple rates of return and the internal rate of return is inoperable. The modified internal rate of return is a technique to deal with the problem, but it violates the spirit of a rate of return rule. The modified internal rate of return is not generated solely by the project's cash flows and costs, and therefore it's not a true rate of return. And it's also dependent on the cost of capital. For typical investment projects, the internal rate of return and the net present value make the same accept reject decision for independent projects. But the internal rate of return fails with mutually exclusive projects. The internal rate of return is unreliable in ranking projects because it's a relative measure that ignores issues of scale and it also has a bias for projects with higher early cash flows. This timing bias is due to an incorrect assumption that project cash flow is reinvested at the internal rate of return. The correct assumption is reinvestment at the cost of capital. But the internal rate of return can be used for mutually exclusive projects when based on an incremental analysis through the calculation of an incremental internal rate of return. Of our two general investment decision rules, net present value rules in practice are consistent with maximizing shareholders' wealth. But the rate of return rule is imperfectly translated into practice as the internal rate of return rule. It can be mathematically inoperable, and it can give decisions that are not consistent with maximizing shareholders' wealth in the case of mutually exclusive projects. Other investment decision rules. In this topic, we'll look at the other decision rules. The profitability index, payback, and book rate of return. The profitability index is a discounted cash flow rule that is closely related to net present value. Profitability index is the ratio of the present value of the investment divided by the cost of the investment. It's a cost-benefit ratio. It might also be thought of as a relative measure of net present value. If the profitability index is equal to 1, the investment costs as much as it's worth. Its net present value is equal to 0. If the profitability index is greater than 1, the investment is worth more than it costs. Its net present value is greater than 0. If the profitability index is less than 1, the investment costs more than it's worth. Its net present value is less than 0. The profitability decision rule for independent projects is to accept all projects with the index greater than 1. When evaluating independent projects for an accept-reject decision, the profitability index rule and the net present value rule will make the same decision. When evaluating between mutually exclusive projects, the profitability index rules rank the projects by their index and choose the project with the highest index. In this example, we have two projects of different scale. We calculate the profitability index and net present value for both projects. The profitability index rule chooses project A. It has the higher index. The net present value rule chooses project B, the project with the higher net present value. In a conflict between decisions, the net present value rule wins. Like the internal rate of return, the profitability index is a relative measure that ignores the scale of the projects. So the profitability index is unreliable in ranking projects when a significant difference in scale exists among the projects. The profitability index can be useful in situations in which the firm has insufficient funds to undertake all positive net present value projects. Such a situation is called capital rationing. 
Soft capital rationing occurs when the limitations on capital spending are self-imposed by the firm. Hard capital rationing occurs when the firm is unable to raise sufficient funds in the financial markets due to some barrier between the firm and the market. Under capital rationing, the limited investment funds must be rationed and invested in such a manner as to maximize net present value under capital rationing. The profitability index can be a tool for selecting among various combinations of projects. To maximize wealth under capital rationing, the firm would invest in that combination of positive net present value projects that maximize the weighted average profitability index. Let's look at an example. The firm's capital budget is limited to $300,000. The firm has four positive net present value projects requiring the following investment in thousands of dollars. The profitability index is calculated for each project. The firm just can't invest in projects with the highest net present value. It has to allocate its limited funds among projects to get the biggest bang per buck. So we examine all possible combinations of projects that the $300,000 can finance and calculate the weighted average profitability index for each combination and choose that combination with the highest weighted average. Let's look at the weighted average of the combination consisting only of Project A. Of the $300,000 budget, $200,000 is invested in Project A. So we weight Project A's index of 2.15 by the proportion of the budget invested in A, 200,000 divided by 300,000. The remaining 100,000 can't finance any of the remaining projects, so it's essentially invested at an index of zero. That index is weighted by 100,000 divided by 300,000 and the weighted average index is 1.43. We do that for all possible combinations of projects and the combination consisting of project B and D have the highest weighted average profitability index and so that combination should be chosen. It also results in the highest total net present value. Advantages of the Profitability Index It's closely related to net present value and leads to identical decisions for independent projects. As a cost-benefit ratio, it's easy to understand and easy to communicate. And it can be useful when investment funds are limited. The problem with the Profitability Index is it's unreliable when making comparisons of mutually exclusive investments. Payback. The payback period is the number of years it takes a project to recover its cost. The basis of the payback rule is that acceptable projects pay back in a required time frame. So a cutoff date is established which provides a standard hurdle that all projects must meet or better. When evaluating independent projects for an accept-reject decision, the payback rule accepts projects with payback periods shorter than the cutoff date. When evaluating mutually exclusive projects, the payback ranks projects by their payback period and chooses that project with the shortest payback period. Consider the logic of the payback rule. The payback rule assumes that more valuable projects have stronger cash flows, which result in faster payback. It also assumes that projects with faster payback are less risky than projects with longer payback. Let's look at an example. We have a four-year project with an initial investment of $1,000 that needs to be paid back. The payback period is the number of years it takes for the accumulated cash flow to equal the initial investment. So let's start accumulating the cash flow. At time zero we have a negative thousand dollars. The first year cash flow is two hundred dollars 
So at the end of the year, our cumulative cash flow is negative $800. The cash flow over year two is $400. So at the end of year two, the accumulated cash flow is negative $400. The cash flow over year three is $600. So at the end of year three, the accumulated cash flow is $200. The cash flow over year four is $750. So at the end of year four, the accumulated cash flow is $950. The initial investment was paid back sometime between year two and year three. At the end of year two, we had $400 of initial investment to pay back, and over the year, $600 of cash flow to pay it back. So the payback period is two years plus 400 divided by 600 or 2.67 years. Let's demonstrate some of the problems presented by the payback rule. In the examples, the cutoff date for the payback periods is two years. First consider project A. A doesn't make the cut. Its payback period is 2.2 years, so it's rejected but A has a large positive net present value. The cause of the incorrect decision for A is that the payback rule ignored this large $5,000 payment because it was made after the cutoff date. The payback rule ignores all cash flows after the cutoff date, and so it doesn't consider the total value of a project. Consider projects B and C. Both have similar cash flows and both are accepted by the payback rule. But B has a negative net present value, C has a positive net present value. Although the magnitudes of the cash flows are the same, what's different is the timing of the cash flows. The payback rule ignores the time value of money. It gives equal weight to all cash flows before the cutoff date. Now let's introduce project D. The cash flows of projects C and D have the same magnitude and timing, and so they have the same payback period and are equally acceptable according to the payback rule. But D's cash flows are riskier, and therefore D has a higher opportunity cost of capital and a negative net present value. The payback rule handles risk poorly with an arbitrary cutoff date and applies that cutoff date to all projects regardless of their differences in risk. So the problems with the payback rule. The payback ignores all cash flows after the cutoff date. It ignores the time value of money. And it handles risk poorly. A variation of the payback is the discounted payback. The cash flows are discounted. And the payback becomes a number of years for the discounted cash flows to recover the project's cost. In this example, I discounted the cash flows at a cost of capital of 10% and then accumulated the discounted cash flows. The payback occurs sometime between year 3 and year 4. At the end of year 3, we have $36.81 of initial investment to pay back, and over the year, we have $512 of discounted cash flow to pay it back. So the payback period is 3 plus 36.81 divided by 512.26 or 3.07 years. Although the discounted payback considers time value money, it still ignores the cash flows after the cutoff date and handles risk with an arbitrary cutoff date. Book rate of return. The book rate of return is calculated as the average net income divided by the average book value over the project's life. It's also called the accounting rate of return. We immediately recognize that it's using the wrong data. The components of the book rate of return are tax and accounting figures, 
not market values nor cash flows. To calculate the book rate of return, we just average the accounting net income for the project over its economic life. And then average its net book value, its book value adjusted for accumulated depreciation over its economic life. And the book rate of return is this average net income over this average net book value. Problems with the book rate of return. It's not a true rate of return. It has no economic meaning whatsoever. It ignores the time value of money. It can't be compared against the opportunity cost of capital. It's not a true rate of return. It's not based upon market values or cash flows. It has absolutely no economic meaning at all. So it requires some arbitrary target rate of return that the book value rate of return must exceed. And once again, it's based on the wrong data. It's based on accounting net income and book values, not cash flows and market values.